Uh, thanks uh, to everyone that is joining us. Uh, we're going to have a, a lovely evening, I think. Uh, and uh, this is going to be the first uh, session uh, around misinformation and information uh, in general. Uh, this is the topic of this year's uh, Friends of the LIA Libraries um, sessions, speaker series. Uh, so await uh, other good uh, presentations in the coming new year. Uh, and we hope you're having a great night and an evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, we are open to the public uh, and uh, we're uh, looking forward to see you all in person. Uh, we're gonna uh, have uh, lots of uh, new things that uh, are showing up in the coming year. You can join our friends group. Uh, we are uh, happy to have new members uh, coming to the library and supporting our programs. Uh, I'm going to put the link uh, once we start the program. Uh, we have uh, usually around five or six presentations a year uh, about different topics. Next year's topic is going to be about uh, uh, how to um, preserve the earth and uh, the ecosystem that we, we live in. Uh, this year, we're going to think more about misinformation. Uh, generally, just in you know, information, misinformation, and missing information and missed information is kind of what the library is kind of busy with uh, throughout uh, our existence. <laughs> so uh, you know, this is such a good topic, uh, and we're we're trying to do our best to supplement your lives uh, in in uh, with correct information as much as we can. Uh, but in addition, uh, you know, like to kind of story tell the information in a way that's compelling and is emotionally appealing uh, so you can find a home uh, in uh, intellectually and otherwise uh, within our walls, um, virtual or not. <laughs> so uh, we hope that you're going to have a, a great session today. Uh, numbers are kind of beginning to stabilize. Uh, I see that there are around 60 something people. Uh, that's great. Uh, so uh, what we'll do today is I'm gonna say a few words, which I already do. Uh, and then I'm gonna um, uh, present and introduce uh, Dr. Mariana De Maio. Uh, and uh, then uh, we're gonna have her uh, talk uh, for um, some time. Uh, and then we're gonna open the floor for some of your questions. Uh, you can type them on the uh, Q&A uh, using the Q&A button. Uh, and we're gonna try and answer them as, as much as we can. Uh, and then we'll end uh, the session today. <laughs> so, um, okay, here I start uh, officially. Uh, so uh, welcome everybody uh, to today's session. It's uh, a Friends of the LIA Library session. Uh, this group is working for many, many years now, almost 40 years uh, to kind of make sure that our lives uh, in the library and beside, outside of it are richer and more interesting and engaging. Uh, and we hope that you're uh, having a good time uh, when you're with us. <laughs> so uh, this, this uh, session, is about misinformation and we are trying to kind of encompass many different themes uh, uh, in this year's uh, kind of topic. Uh, you know that uh, we all live in a uh, quite um, uh, complicated environment uh, as it comes to information and so does the library. Um, so thinking how to preserve information, what do we do with misinformation in general? Do we, do we need to keep it because it's important also for you know, future studies and research, uh, but uh, uh, not one library can do it on its own. <laughs> so uh, you know, we need to kind of think how do we, uh, how do we retain information, misinformation? How do we uh, make sure that uh, it's available? Uh, and how to also kind of opinionate about what, what is making sense. Uh, and we have uh, lots of people busy thinking about those issues uh, and uh, probably you too. So um, today we're gonna have uh, Dr. Mariana De Mayo uh, uh, presenting for us. Um, she is actually in the middle of her research uh, leave. <laughs> so thank you, Mariana, uh, for uh, ready, being ready to present. Um, and uh, Dr. Mariana De Mayo is an assistant professor 
uh, in the Department of Journalism and Communication at Lehigh University. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Florida in 2015. Uh, her teaching and research interests lie in agenda setting, political communication, media influence on political attitudes and behavior, online and multimedia journalism, new communication technologies, health communication, and media use in immigrant communities. Um, and, and if you check online, <laughs> you'll find many, many different uh, articles and, uh, and other um, opinion pieces by Mariana. Uh, and I think it's, it's quite uh, staggering to see how many different uh, uh, um, uh, venues uh, uh, Mariana is kind of is, is, uh, active in. Uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward to, to this uh, presentation today. So uh, I'm gonna now uh, hand it to you, uh, Mariana, and thank you. And then, you know, think about questions as they show up and just type them uh, into the Q&A. Um, so thanks to everybody and Mariana, uh, please. Thank you. Well, uh, first, I want to thank uh, the friends of the Lehigh University Libraries for the opportunity to be here, offer me to talk to you this afternoon about uh, what I think is an extremely important topic that is affecting our everyday lives uh, and sometimes without us even, in, even noticing that it's happening to us, right? So um, I'm going to share uh, some slides uh, so that uh, you can follow me as I talk um, with you. But um, what I want to talk today is about how this uh, global uh, phenomenon that is the spread of misinformation is posing uh, new challenges uh, for uh, how we navigate life today. Um, but before I start digging into the issue itself uh, and the reasons why we are what we are, I wanted to kind of like make some definitions so that we make sure we are all on the same page, that we kind of can following each other uh, on uh, what I'm trying to talk to you about. So um, the first... Um, definition I want to make is infodemic. The title of uh, my talk, I'm going to go back, but the title of my talk is Infodemic, the Pandemic of, of Misinformation. And you may think, well, she's going to talk about COVID. And not really, and yes, maybe, but uh, I wanted to tell you what I think, what, what I define as an infodemic. Um, it, it is actually a word that came uh, from the World Health Organization when, you know, there was an abundance of information, uh, some that was accurate, some that was not, that was making hard for people to find uh, trustworthy uh, sources and reliable guidance when they needed it regarding COVID. But I want to go and, and use it uh, in this context, right? Um, because we are uh, in this stage and age uh, with the access to digital technologies and all kinds of information around us, we are really on an overload of information. We have information overload. And sometimes deciphering it, going through it, it's not easy. We have a hard time and everybody, I'm including myself because this includes everybody. Um, the other uh, definition that I wanted to touch in is what is information, that what do we call information in this context. So I want to um, talk about information as knowledge that you get about someone or someone or something. It's basically facts or details about a subject, uh, a thing or a person. Uh, that's what we're going to be calling information today. Then there is another um, definition that has to do with what is misinformation. Misinformation, different than uh, information, is false information. Uh, 
that it is false information that it's important to notice that was not created with the intention of hurting others. Misinformation often starts by someone who genuinely wants to understand a topic and cares about keeping other people safe and well, and then uh, is shared, and then others that feel the same, this person feels, shares the information away, and everybody that is sharing this information, they think this is good information. But unfortunately, they are not sharing good information. And um, depending on whether they are uh, sharing, depending on what they are sharing, this misinformation could be quite harmful. So this is important to know that sometimes without knowing, we could be distributing false information or misinformation. Now there is another um, concept that is important to know, that is the concept of disinformation and um, unlike misinformation this false information is created with the intention of profiting from it or causing harm uh, this harm could be toward a person a group of people an organization a country this information um, generally serves uh, some kind of agenda it can be dangerous and during the pandemic, we have seen it used to try to um, erode our trust to each other, uh, uh, our trust to government, to health officials, public institutions. So it could be quite harmful in a way that it could be um, affecting people's lives, so even making them die for, bad information. So these are the four um, different concepts that I want to make sure that we're all sitting on the same place and all understanding them in the same way. Um, the, nature, the nature of how um, information spreads um, today, as I was saying before, um, really went through drastic transformation, especially in the last decade, uh, with the rise of social media and other platforms that make the dissemination of information and hence misinformation and disinformation very easy. So um, I want to talk about the role of these new platforms, uh, these social media platforms particularly, uh, because they have been um, somehow uh, a very important source for producing and disseminating news, um, making information easily accessible uh, because uh, there is low cost and limited space. Uh, there is not so much government surveillance over what's published there and what's not. Um, users become gatekeepers in a way that they are the ones who decide what information is being shared. Um, whereas when uh, regular news media, for example, you have an editor um, that is deciding which information goes to the paper or what's the information that it's going to be on the 6 p.m. news uh, on television. Um, they beauty of social media is that we have uh, no gatekeeping and we can publish everything, right? And anything. Uh, so this together with the access at the global level uh, and the use of internet uh, that has risen, that this doesn't mean that we're still we still have a digital divide. We still have areas of the world that have less access than others. But still, um, this has been increasing and uh, this has provided more and more opportunities uh, for communication, and for taking action in one way or another. And basically anything and everything can happen virtually. 
Uh, this, a while ago, uh, was called by um, a researcher named uh, Manuel Castells, the Network Society. This means that all aspects of our life happen around communication technology. And if you think about it, um, our lives are attached to our phones, mostly all the time, right? Um, I don't think I know anybody that doesn't have a smartphone nowadays. Uh, it's very, and uh, if you know somebody, uh, that's a rare rarity, right? Um, so power relations, uh, those relationships that uh, constitute the foundation of all societies, uh, and the processes uh, challenging uh, these institutionalized power relations are increasingly shaped and decided in the communication field uh, because of this uh, influence of this network society, of these technologies in our lives. So there have been a lot of research studies that have shown how this social media platform have used to foster conversation, have been used to foster conversations uh, um, about social and political issues. Um, people have studied the Arab Spring. Uh, people have studied the Occupy Wall Street movement, the Black, Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Uh, all these things are conversations that in one way or another happen on these social media platforms. They happen online. Uh, it's not that they didn't happen in real life, but they happen somehow online. And Twitter particularly, but other social media platforms may have played a very crucial role in framing the conversations about uh, public policy and social issues regarding these events. Um, they have, maybe they promoted involvement on the, of the public online and offline. Um, in the case of Ferguson, for example, uh, social media was used to get people together and participate on demonstrations on the streets. So there was a connection between what was happening online and what was happening on, on offline. Um, and this became uh, very, very palpable um, when, uh, particularly when uh, there was starting to be evidence of uh, the use of propaganda uh, during the 2016 uh, U.S. presidential elections and mostly the, during the campaign um, because there was information that was used to persuade voters against voting for Hillary Clinton, for example. Um, so basically today, um, management of politics and conflict requires somehow uh, disseminating some kind of political narratives uh, through a growing, uh, what I would call virtual constituency uh, uh, that acquires information through social networks rather than through print media or local communities as it was used to happen. And, and this, you know, um, makes us think that the optimism that we had at the beginning that uh, you know, we, social media was here for social change and all these good things were going to happen thanks to social media. It was kind of like, you know, social media platforms, vehicles of democratization, social change. But this started to fade um, when we started having some concerns about this political manipulation and spread of disinformation. And maybe, um, uh, I the 2016 campaign was kind of like uh, a key point for that. Uh, so rather than um, being calm and open to uh, some kind of rational dialogue, the diverse narratives, uh, social media content was becoming more prone to extreme, uh, extreme views uh, uh, where emotions were leading to conflict more than anything. 
Uh, and so uh, researchers, uh, internet analysts started to share concern that this exchange of online content may be threatening uh, the future of the internet as it was conceived. And I would go further to say that it may threaten democracy as we see it today, you know. Um, certain um, characteristics of how social media platform work uh, could put at risk uh, some of the fundamental principles of our liberal democracies uh, because they are serving as platforms uh, to disseminate misleading political information uh, that influences how the public think and that you know, creates an opportunity for government and corporations to use um, some kind of dishonest practices to pan manipulate public opinion. And in, at the end, it's going to make um, citizens uh, make decisions based on information that is not truthful information and vote for uh, people to represent them that may not represent their interest. Um, one of the things that is being done um, to manipulate public opinion is the use or the creation of uh, what is called troll farms or troll factories. And this is basically social media users that manipulate uh, opinion by intentionally disseminating false information and rumors uh, to cause conflict and antagonism. Uh, this is basically um, rooms that have a lot of computers and a bunch of people that are real people that have accounts that are not about themselves, but they are fake accounts that they use to, um, uh, it, their goal is to influence political opinions. So they use uh, these uh, social media accounts to disseminate information that is most of the time disinformation. Uh, a recent report from the Freedom House uh, showed that uh, several governments across the globe uh, paid these cyber troops to spread propaganda and attack critics. And there were attempts to uh, influence elections. Uh, in one of the countries that this happened is in my home country of Argentina, but in 18 other countries as well. Um, and this type of uh, interventions um, is what uh, in the jargon is called political astrosurfing. So if you ever hear about somebody talking about political astrosurfing, that's what they mean. It's like this intervention of troll far, uh, uh, farms and that are um, producing content and sharing it online to uh, influence elections most of the time. But sometimes it could be to get a product out. Uh, it could be used on different things. Another method, and this is less and less used now because social media companies have been um, implementing different ways of preventing this to happening, but this is, um, uh, they, they use uh, what are called social bots and they are used to disseminate misleading information in the same way that trolls are, but this is, instead of being humans, this is just like a bot that is algorithm, algorithm algorithmically control uh, uh, that and automatically produces content um, that emulates somehow uh, being a human, but um, it's uh, not really a human, right? So um, it's a fake identity and it's really a machine producing content. Uh, these social uh, bots are used sometimes to infiltrate uh, social media platforms like Twitter, uh, and become influencer, influential, uh, spread misinformation with the purpose of changing public opinion in the same way as trolls. And they could also be doing surveillance. Uh, they could be used to predict the stock market, uh, distribute malicious content, etc., etc. So they are very similar, trolls and bots. The difference is that trolls are real humans and bots are actually um, machines controlled by algorithms uh, that um, uh, produce uh, 
contact automatically. Um, and the, this use of uh, this polarization and use of uh, uh, the internet in this way or the social media platforms in this way um, creates what's called echo chambers. And this is basically um, the idea that the internet is a place where users go to reaffirm their own political ideologies. So uh, many people believe that social media like Twitter uh, have increased political polarization. So um, they, because they don't promote cooperation, they negatively impact efforts to um, develop progressive public policy. So um, in these communities, so, uh, users are uh, supporting each other's views, uh, reinforcing their common beliefs and idea. And uh, this means that people uh, prefer to consider and examine these ideas and opinions of other people whose ideas uh, and opinions are not significantly different from their, theirs. And if you see this, and you can kind of see it at the, in the middle picture here, uh, you see uh, toward your um, left, like a blue bunch of a black, bunch of blue dots and towards your right a bunch of red dots and that's basically republican and uh, democrats um, echo chambers uh, in twitter this is um, through statistical method called uh, network analysis uh, this um, drawing or uh, data visualization was created and uh, this the image was created to show how people with similar ideas are connecting with each other on the net. So this is kind of like the red echo chamber and the blue echo chamber. And you see just a teeny tiny bit of, of connection in the middle, but not so much. That means that uh, what's happening in Twitter uh, with these users is that they are not talking to each other. They basically are talking to people and ex exchanging opinions and ideas with those that have uh, ideas that are similar to theirs. So there is not much conversation. So this idea of um, this revolutionary idea of social change and diverse opinions and everybody being able to talk to everybody, it's not as really as we were thinking it would be. So why why is that our brains, and I would say in between quotation marks, not really uh, like fake news or like uh, misinformation or disinformation? I use fake news because it's like a more common uh, term used, but why is that this happen? And this happens uh, really because uh, people's inclination to connect with others with similar points of view um, is explained by a theory that is called the cognitive dissonance theory. And this cognitive dissonance theory is the idea that people tend to gravitate toward messages that support their belief system and shy away from opinions that do not align with their views. Um, when people uh, hold contradictory beliefs, values, and behaviors, they find a way to resolve this contradiction, um, to reduce their mental discomfort in a way. So people uh, read media content and choose media channels that support their ideas. Because if not, then that's gonna create some kind of discomfort and they are not gonna feel comfortable and they are gonna go away. So a platform like, like Twitter, uh, where you know users choose who they are going to follow, who they are going to interact with. It's really a fertile field for this idea of political polarization. Um, there was a study that was done uh, on uh, moral and social intolerance on the web. And, and what was found is that uh, um, people uh, find opinions that are analogous to theirs uh, with the idea of reinforcing their points of view. 
and this um, in this sense uh, the internet in somehow creates uh, a context uh, in which our cognitive bias and uh, our exposure to certain things uh, are taking the lead in the processing of information that at the end of the day result in the rise of hate speech and intolerance, even if we don't want to. Um, another way to explain this is through the concept of confirmation bias. And this may be a concept that some people know it more than uh, others. Uh, but what is really confirmation bias? It's, you know, one of the strongest biases humans hold. Uh, it's the tendency to search for, to interpret, to favor, and to recall information that in a way confirms or supports our prior, prior beliefs or values. Um, and believe it or not, and even though we don't want to think this way, the greater our cognitive capacity, the greater our ability to rationalize and to interpret information at will and to creatively twist data uh, to feel our to fit our opinions to what we want to believe. Um, so really echo chambers are a fertile ground through um, disseminating misinformation and disinformation and distorting people's perspectives because when we are in these platforms, we don't want to see information that contradicts our beliefs and our values. We want to find information that reaffirms our values and our beliefs. So this explains why is that we have this phenomenon? Why is that humans are so prone to disseminating this kind of information? Because uh, that's what we, we want to see what we want to see. Um, so let's take a look at two of the most significant examples that uh, trigger misinformation campaigns in the 2020. Um, misinformation and competing views of reality abounded throughout 2020. I think that the pandemic, and that's why I want to call it the infodemic as well, um, was so rich in this sense, you know, uh, unprecedented national news events, um, you know, a hostile political divide, polarized news streams, all of these created a ripe environment for uh, misinformation, uh, made up news throughout the 2020. Uh, the truth uh, that surrounded um, two very intense and year-long storylines, the pandemic and the presidential election, uh, what, um, was offered uh, as a matter for dispute. Uh, whether because there was genuine uh, confusion or because there was an intentional distortion of reality. So um, I want to talk about these two significant events and I will go very quickly through them because I want to leave time for the Q&A and get questions from you and discuss this uh, more openly um, with everybody. But so then, to summarize, related to politics, uh, I, I want us to look at how misinformation and disinformation campaigns may put at risk our democracy. And related to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, so that we are conscious about how these campaigns uh, of misinformation and disinformation can affect the health of millions of people and their lives, uh, really. Um, so let's go uh, to talk, let's talk about why uh, misinformation about 
election could be a problem. Um, misinformation and disinformation around the 2020 election was a very serious problem because uh, false information influenced how people voted or could vote and even their ability to vote. And it came through uh, many ways, but one of those main ways was social media ads, tweets from government officials. Um, and if someone were to read an article with incorrect or some kind of information with incorrect information on in it um, about a proposition on the ballot in their state and then go vote on it, um, they could accidentally be voting against what they really care about because they got information that was not the truth information. Um, so another way is, you know, of how this false information can affect the election is if someone sees false information online about how to vote by mail, for example, and their valuable vote may not be counted and they could be really upset about that. Um, that's, um, you know, an example of this information related to this year's elections mail in voting was around mailing voting uh, and you know because we are in a pandemic many people uh, voted by mail instead of going to the polling places and um, there were concerns that came along with that uh, because people um, started to believe some misinformation about how the mailing voting process was they um, maybe because they already do not trust the vote by mail system uh, then they look for uh, news that were confirming their bias and ignore the news that were saying otherwise so um, for example um, Trump uh, in, via Twitter stated that mailing ballots were uh, substantially increases the risk of crime and border fraud, and this was uh, proven to be untrue. But uh, some people, you know, a large number of people from the U.S. Uh, um, actually have been voting by mail, uh, and the FBI has claimed that there is no evidence uh, of uh, coordinated voter fraud by mail. But still. Um, some people believe this was true, and uh, this was just one example. Uh, there was a tweet, uh, another tweet by the, pre the former president that said that there were millions of ballots that had been altered by Democrats, uh, only for Democrats, and this was proven false because there was no evidence that millions of ballots were altered by Democrats. Um, there is no... no um, Actually, there is no current evidence of uh, any ballots that were improperly altered by anyone. Uh, there was also some uh, inf uh, false information distributed regarding voting deadlines. Uh, Trump alleged that there was um, voting after the election was uh, over, but there is no evidence of people voting after the election was over. Uh, and is any previous election, some states accepted ballots, including military ballots that were received by election officers after the election, but they had to be mailed on or before election day. So that's not uh, voting after the election, it's voting before the election on on the election day. Um, there were other claims that um, that happened around the election, many, many other claims. And all these claims uh, ended up thinking, with a lot of people thinking, that uh, the elections were rigged. And this meant that many people were very upset. And this ended on the January 6th riot in the Capitol. And that put uh, at risk the succession of power in this country and uh, somehow this having unstable uh, democracy. Um, 
it was uh, really uh, worrisome for everybody, for many people, what happened that day. And that was all uh, instigated by false information. It's actually now being discussed uh, again, uh, all the things around this. The other thing, as I was talking to you, um, is uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and information around uh, the illness, the virus, um, and the severity and the risk assessments of the virus. This um, graph that you see here uh, has uh, different um, statements made by the president that were at the beginning saying that everything was under control and then uh, things were bad, but then things uh, uh, were fading away and, and then that this will eventually disappear. Um, but uh, as this was happening, uh, the numbers of cases were raising significantly. So um, that was not uh, really uh, a good assessment of the situation. You know, there is um, in crisis situations, um, there is often a lot of uncertainty. So people come together, start sharing information in, sorts, in a sort of collective sense-making process. Uh, but, and that process can get things right, but uh, it also can get things wrong. Uh, and then can produce rumors that turn out to be uh, false. Um, so misinformation around COVID-19 was so pervasive that uh, even some patients uh, dying from the disease were still saying that the disease that did not exist, that it was a hoax. Um, these falsehoods or misinformation or disinformation that was distributed during the pandemic, uh, and it is still being distributed, um, it's um, have influenced attitudes and behavior uh, around protective measures such as mask wearing, created tension in school board meetings, um, uh, get people uh, struggle around alternative treatments such as the chloroquine, the ivermectin, uh, using disinfectants. I mean, people have died for using these alternative treatments that they shouldn't have used. Um, whether, um, you know, vaccines may have a Bluetooth or may be magnetized so that, uh, you know, uh, you can keep, put a key on your forehead and sticks and spoons and forks all, all over your body. Uh, and, you know, um, people, most people that are unvaccinated in the United States today think that the COVID vaccines are uh, more of a threat to their health than contracting the virus itself. Um, and this is because of uh, misinformation that has been distributed and also disinformation that has been distributed. Uh, misinformation about COVID-19 and vaccines is actually keeping people from getting the shots and driving and increasing cases, not just in the United States, but all over the world. So this is a problem. Um, so I want to present the problem, but I want us to think of uh, possible solutions. So how do we navigate the infodemic? How do, how, what kind of tips we can use to identify misinformation or disinformation and make sure that we're well-informed and take actions that uh, are going to keep us well-informed and fight misinformation. Um, so I gave myself the opportunity to play this uh, as, you play with the terms of the infodemic and the pandemic and talk about information as something that spreads as a virus and that, um, but also understanding that misinformation and disinformation uh, also spreads like a virus. And when this kind of information is excited, it can spread even faster. 
and faster and faster and faster and that can be deadly. So we need to focus on the truth. And to focus on the truth, I want us to explore together some tips that are going to help us identify misinformation and disinformation. The first thing that I want you to uh, bring with you after today's talk is to think about um, how important it is to learn some of the skills that are going to make a dramatic difference in your ability to uh, sort fat from fiction on the web and everything in between because not everything is black and white, right? We have things in between. Um, these skills uh, are skills that are going to help you, you know, uh, be less vulnerable to misinformation and disinformation. Uh, this is not my idea. This is an idea that was done by the director of blended and network learning at Washington State University. His name is Mike Caulfield. Um, and he organized these values in this model that he calls SIFT. And basically it's an acronym for the word STOP. Uh, and when you stop, uh, you ask yourself, do you know the website or source of information? Start with a plan, check, you know, check the website, consider what you want to know and your purpose. Um, usually a quick check could be enough, but sometimes you may need, need a deep investigation that to claim that all claim to verify that all claims that are made and all the sources are correct. The other value is investigate. Investigate the source. Uh, know the expertise and agenda of your source so that you can interpret it. Uh, there are many ways that you can look online for who a source is. Uh, make sure that you read carefully and you consider everything, every piece of information that you can find about the source. The other value is find trusted coverage. And you need to make sure that you're looking for the best information of a topic, uh, scan multiple sources sometimes, uh, see what the consensus is, find uh, more in-depth and read about more viewpoints. And even if you don't agree with the consensus, help you, it will, this will help you investigate further. And finally, the last uh, uh, value that you need to learn is tracing claims, quotes, and media back to the original quote, uh, context. And this is, um, you know, what happened, you know, am I, if I'm seeing a clip of a video, uh, what was the context? What happened before or after that clip? When I, maybe I read a, an article that was talking about a research paper. Uh, then I go and I read the research paper. Was it accurately reported or not? Uh, find the original source to see the context so that you can decide if the version you have is accurately presented. So it is a lot of work, but it's work that is worth doing um, before disseminating information that could not be truthful. So stop, investigate, find, and trace. I want to say just a little bit more about using fact-checking sites, which is a one way that you can um, check information. And I want to recommend you three fact-checking sites that could be very useful. Uh, one of them is factcheck.org, which is a project of the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania, and they monitor factual, factual accuracy of political speeches, debates, news story, and other communications. So everything is there. PolitiFact, uh, it's a project of uh, the Tampa Bay Times, 
and it's an independent, non-partisan fact-checking website that rates the accuracy of claims by elected officials and others who speak about uh, U.S. politics. Um, their website is politifact.com, and it has a page uh, exclusively for Pennsylvania. So you can go to politifact.com slash Pennsylvania, and you can find all kinds of claims uh, done about Pennsylvania. And the last one, which I think is the oldest one, is Snoops. And this is snoops.com. And this is an evidence-based source uh, for fact-checking urban legends, folklore, myth, rumors, all kinds of misinformation. Uh, I've been using Snoops for years now, so I this is the first one I go when something sounds fishy to me. But the other two are very good too, and you should use them as well. Lastly, one more thing that I want to say is that just as we can protect against uh, ourselves against COVID-19 by washing our hands, uh, having physical distance, wearing masks. We can also slow down the spread of misinformation and disinformation by practicing some information hygiene, I would say. Uh, and that's uh, something basic that you can do. And it's before sharing something, ask yourself these questions. How does this make me feel? Why am I sharing these? How do I know if it's true? Where did it come from? Whose agenda might I be supporting by sharing it? And if you know something is false or that it makes you angry, don't share it to debunk it or to make fun of it because that's also going to spread the misinformation or disinformation further. So this is a way of bringing this back to the spreading the virus or the spreading misinformation. Uh, example, if we have a person that didn't send a rumor to the group chat, or if you have a person that double checked their facts, or if you have a person that got their news from trusted sources or ask how do you know that's true, we are going to reduce the spread of misinformation. Um, in other words, digital literacy is really our best weapon against misinformation. So my proposition to you is let's flatten the infodemic curve and if we do this, we can preserve our democracy and our health during these challenging times. Um, so thank you so much for listening. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions for me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. De Maya. Uh, so we got two questions from the uh, listeners and viewers. Uh, one is about, or we have another one, so please do continue and ask uh, using the Q&A button. So one question is, how do we make people accountable uh, for creating and spreading disinformation? Uh, do we have a vaccine for this pandemic? <laughs> well, I, I think that our vaccine is uh, to really have this uh, self uh, um, self-control, I would say, of uh, looking into uh, how we, how and when we may be able to disseminate information and before uh, clicking the share button that sometimes is very tempting, uh, think about what you're sharing. Uh, even if it's, uh, as I said before, you know, even if you think that something is outrageous, like how are they saying this? the moment that you are sharing that, it's disseminating it. So you need to think how you, how and why, and ask yourself those questions, you know, why am I doing this? What am I getting out of it? What's my purpose? And with that, um, I think we are, maybe it's not a vaccine, but it's a treatment. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's, it's challenging uh, because um, 
we are on information overload. Uh, and it's really hard to distinguish sometimes because of what I was saying, you know, our brains and are destined to um, finding information that agrees with us, right? Because that makes us feel comfortable. Uh, we want, uh, you know, uh, to, to find information that agrees with us. And that's why uh, these social networks are so popular because we choose who to follow uh, we get into conversations that with people that agrees with us, and unless we really push ourselves to the other side, we're ne never, never, ever seeing the other side. We don't. So that's why we have to practice these um, things of pushing ourselves for that. Maybe I'll follow up with a, a one question I had uh, here. Uh, so sometimes. You know, like uh, if you're looking at gossip, you know, the history of the term and you kind of go back and, you know, you get to like gender relations and like the way by which eco ecosystem or chambers are kind of supporting and empowering a certain group uh, in a way that is positive, you know, because we, we not necessarily always the information that we uh, are exposed to are uh, uh, you is used uh, to the benefit of the of the uh, good uh, and um, so what do we do you know with kind of how to assess uh, that gray zone you know like the the areas where you know like information is complicated and we have you know like uh, uh, various uh, ways to assess you know the the truthfulness of kind of uh, the situation, how do we insert, you know, like a good and a positive uh, um, decision making, I guess, around that uh, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, how to discard and what do we and what do we discard when we discover that there is a this this information or, or misinformation uh, situation? It's relevant, obviously, for the libraries because everything is information, as as far as we are concerned. Uh, trying to kind of make sure that we are uh, preserving it for whoever wants to uh, think about it later. Uh, but what do you think about you know that kind of area where uh, echo chambers and information is being used to support uh, uh, agendas that may be very important for uh, our society? I think I will go back again to this uh, SIFT model, right? Uh, uh, of, you know, stop, interpret, uh, and, and find and trace and and i think it's just um we need to allow our you know we are in our societies today go so fast and and this is the conversation we have uh, i have sometimes with my journalism students you know uh, about this need of getting um you know the being the first one uh, delivering information and what does that mean in the sense of uh, what would that become for uh, the news that we are giving away, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes if we are second but the information that we give to our audience, um, readers, listeners, um, viewers, um, is confirmed and fact-checked is always better than being the first giving false information, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that that's something that we as a society have to learn, that being first is not always the first, the, ver the best thing. Um, uh, I don't think it's easy. <laughs> uh, I think it's, it's a process that... Um, that we have to go through but i also think that um the most important thing is you know giving us time to think but also understanding who the source of information is um mm -hmm. i think that more and more in our society we're discovering that there is not such a thing as a journalist that is completely objective because journalists are human beings. Um, 
so understanding you know what the source of information is and where where it's coming from and how it was produced uh, what were the context of the production of that information I think that that's gonna help us understand but as I said before the best weapon we have right now is digital literacy and with that I would add you know, as somebody that is a journalist, I would say media literacy goes hand in hand with it. Mm -hmm. And we have to, you know, go to our schools, not don't wait until we get to college to uh, start thinking about that. Right. Uh, start in elementary school. How do you read the newspapers or where do you get news? Um, um, I think that that's very important or or even you know analyzing any source of news that uh, people choose as their source of information but how do you analyze it how do you have a critical eye or a critical ear to what you're hearing or listening uh, i think that that's the most important thing nowadays thank you uh, I, we, I, I'll follow up with uh, a question from uh, Jack Lul. Uh, thanks uh, very much for the very thoughtful presentation. What can journalism and society do when a large percentage of the population is content with confirmation bias and avoiding inconvenient truths? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's actually a question that I'm asking myself when I'm <laughs> Uh, I'm doing, I'm working on projects that are trying to look at how uh, I'm actually working right now on a project on Latino vote and looking at um, uh, why uh, we're looking at uh, Latinos in, in Miami, Arizona, and Pennsylvania, and uh, looking at why and how they made the decisions uh, in the last presidential election to choose one candidate or another. And, and, and one thing that we're finding is that, um, that people are, you know, in these chambers or in these places where they, uh, they find information that they agree with and that they find comfortable with and they share um, WhatsApp messages. WhatsApp is a social media platform uh, kind of like texting platform that is um, why, why it's not as used in the US but it's more it's used a lot in Europe and Latin America and Latinos in the US use it a lot because they use it to communicate with their families in Latin America and they share videos and things and 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 they are in these bubbles uh, and they are fine and they don't even see that there is a problem with that so mm -hmm. I think uh, my answer to Jack is going back, you know, when, when to children and educating uh, media literacy. I think that's our answer for all of these things and have critical thinkers that are going to uh, stop uh, and think and analyze information. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, uh, you know, you do a lot of research in maybe different language than English and uh, thinking about different countries? Is there like kind of a, a difference when it comes to kind of dissemination of information in this sort? Uh, you know, I'm myself coming from a different culture uh, as well. And, you know, like uh, from uh, Israel in my case, and, uh, you know, information is sometimes quite often a life or death uh, uh, question, and you want to be quick as much as you can to just know what's going on. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so there is a, a tendency to kind of possibly be more open to kind of, you know, misinformation, disinformation, et cetera, just to kind of make sure that you know uh, how, how, to, uh, how to continue your living. Uh, is is there something you're uh, you, you, you kind of when you are comparing uh, cultures and kind of thinking about you know different languages even you know that is kind of uh, supportive uh, of a different kind of mapping or network uh, activity uh, than you know like what we're accustomed to or what we're thinking of when we think about the U.S. Um, so in my case, I look at Latin America and. I look at the US as well, and I see a lot of similarities. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see much difference in the way people uh, uh, behave uh, toward uh, social networks and social, like digital platforms in general. Um, I think it's very similar. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I'm going to uh, going back to COVID. <laughs> uh, so uh, Linda is asking, uh, with regards to COVID, what do you think about the lack of information? So uh, we're not told that most deaths, according to Linda, <laughs> uh, occur among patients who are obese or longtime smokers. Uh, we're uh, told not to treat with uh, Invermestine, but the primary ingredient in the new Pfizer drug is Invermestine. So, um, you know, it, what do we do with lack of information that is pertinent? You know, this is an evolving <laughs> disease that every every few days, you know, like I, I kind of uh, just mentioned Israel, you know, that that's a, a, a country that has uh, most of the population already third vaccinated and like, you know, there's uh, one of those pilot populations you know, countries uh, looking at that uh, and, and, you know, like, so what do we do when it's an evolving situation that things are happening quickly and as journalists and, you know, as, as a researcher, you know, you want to be stopping and doing the, the steps that, you know, are uh, needed to verify information at the same time, you know, like, uh, life and death situations and we, we want to be uh, and, and also just maybe thinking about the storytelling piece which is important as well you know you want to capture attention uh, of people that have been absorbing information after you know so many months and how do you do that in a way that is still effective and truthful uh, and it's not like going to be kind of verging on the misinformation, disinformation, you know, like that uh, you, we would like to avoid. So um, it's kind of, a, I guess, a challenge for a journalist to try and, you know, present facts at this time about what's going on. I think it, it's, it's a really good question because I, it has many answers to it, I think. I, um, and this is not something that I have thought before, so I, uh, I'll, I'll be thinking out loud as I respond, but I, um, I think that uh, in one way is you know making sure that our journalists are well trained to ask the right questions and to search for the right data, right? Um, that's one important thing. Another thing is um, is that um, we need to know which ones are the sources that we trust. But I, I have to say, in my case, uh, I always trust the World Health Organization. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, they were saying, no masks, that's ridiculous, you don't need them. And I was uh, doing research in Paraguay when the pandemic started, and I had to run back home. And on my way back, I got COVID because uh, I was not wearing a mask and somebody on the plane right behind me was coughing all night long. <laughs> and um, wearing a mask would have saved my, my, my being uh, getting uh, COVID. I don't know. Maybe it would have been something that would have prevented uh, me. Like if everybody had to wear a mask in that airplane, maybe the person coughing would not have been that bad. I don't know, uh, but so the pandemic really create, what I wanna say with this is that the pandemic, and I think that the reason why they were saying no to masks, and this is my own uh, think, thinking here, is that there were not enough masks for everybody. So um, they wanted to make sure that health um, workers had masks and, um, if they said everybody has to wear a mask, it would have been terrible. So I think that it was difficult after that to trust anything that the worker organization said, at least for me, in my own experience, right? So I'm bringing myself as an anecdotal example of uh, how the pandemic actually destroyed some of the most uh, trusted sources for many of us. Um, and how do we find 
trustworthy information. In my case, has been going to publications uh, and looking at what The Lancet is publishing, you know, and reading through academic publications and trying to find out and, 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 and not even being sure whether what's being published is real or not, because there is a lot of other things that get into this, you know, the interests that are behind some pharmaceutical companies and uh, the grants that are uh, being put somewhere that are not elsewhere and things like that. Um, you know, the whole discussion about, um, you know, uh, as I said before, I'm from Argentina, and in Argentina, the most uh, common vaccine that was used was uh, Sputnik, which is the Russian vaccine. And uh, based on uh, research, it's a pretty good vaccine, equal to Pfizer and Moderna. But in the US, uh, it's not being recognized. Uh, so if any of my family members that got Sputnik want to come and visit me, Guess what? They can't. Um, so it's uh, that gives another layer of uh, distrust on our common sources of information, right? So I think it's complicated um, because the pandemic uh, put in the open how vulnerable we are. How, our, how vulnerable our institutions are, how vulnerable our governments are, how vulnerable our econ economies are. Um, and we are redefining many things. And I think that it's something that is not going to end today. It's going to be a process. For sure. Uh, another question about the pandemic. Um, do you believe that social media is an influence on the vaccination rates, uh, specifically the low vaccination rates among young adult users? And how would one go about measuring this influence or seeing if there is, uh, in fact, an influence? Okay, so... The influence between social media... So and how do you measure it is actually, uh, you look at what's been published in social media, you analyze that information, and then you talk to people and you analyze that information and then you compare it to each other. If you find that there is uh, some connection there, then you can infer that maybe there is an influence. Um, now, I um, I'm not aware of any studies that have come out specifically looking at this, and I have not looked at this. But I have read some news stories about this uh, that are talking about how information about how um, you know young people don't get as sick as older people and things like that are generating uh, that are creating this uh, thing that young people are not vaccinating as much as others. I mean, low rates of vaccination are very particular to the US. Uh, in other countries, there are much higher rates of vaccination and people are really anxious to get vaccines. And um, I feel sometimes guilty that we have so many vaccines and Nobody wants them, and some people in other countries are desperate for that dose, and they don't have it. So that shows um, uh, some unbalance in this war. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I mean, it's an interesting thing to study. Uh, I don't know if I, I, I will have to look. I, I didn't see any studies, but that doesn't mean they don't exist, of course. Um, yeah, and then uh, the last question we got today uh, for now <laughs> is a question from Linda. Uh, if information is not disseminated, that's kind of general, kind of go back to the uh, kind of uh, high level here. If information is not disseminated, is it misinformation or disinformation? And, and I'm curious, uh, who is who, who is the actor <laughs> is the person yeah. that is not, uh, you know, so, so um, what happens when the information is not uh, disseminated? Um, 
uh, who, who's at fault? <laughs> and, uh, you know, well, I, I think that, uh, you know, um, the state, I, the way I see things, and of course, this is my opinion, has some responsibility on dissemination of certain information uh, that must be disseminated, right? Uh, and in democracies, there are certain uh, rules about what information is public, how do we disseminate this and that. Uh, in countries where there are more authoritarian, it's different um, how, you know, access to information is different in, in different countries. But here in the United States, I mean, we have uh, some rules about uh, how information becomes public uh, and what type of information is public. So um, if it's not being disseminated, um, it may be fault of journalists or it may be that we are uh, right now um, suffering from, in, that, in some areas, from what we call news deserts and is the lack of news outlets that are disseminating information. Um, citizens um, could access this information but may not know how to access this information. So we go back to media literacy and digital literacy again and how we can teach people how to access information, how to check information, how to trust information and all those things is very important. Um, I think that purposely, hide, and this is again me, purposely hiding information, uh, I see it as a way of disinformation more than misinformation because misinformation again is uh, an act that is not, it has no harm intended. But when you are hiding information, then there is some kind of purpose in there. So I would call it disinformation. Thank you. Um, so I think we got to the end of the questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mariana, Dr. Mariana De Maio, for ex exciting uh, talk today. Uh, I want to. I would like to add an L to the <laughs> to the acronym there, and just to say, you know, libraries are really trying hard <laughs> to make people stop and think, and and um, you know, uh, kind of assess, you know, information uh, through time uh, and, and place, uh, and uh, you know. Some of the answers are hard to give on the spot. So, uh, you know, when when we are uh, thinking about those categories, I, I imagine that some of them will maybe be answered at a, a later point. Uh, so, uh, this is what we'd like you to kind of take home, maybe also today, uh, and um, to kind of uh, help us all to think together about what what we are uh, geared to listen to and uh, think about. Um, so this is the first one uh, out of uh, a series of uh, sessions about uh, misinformation uh, and information in general uh, that we, uh, we started today. Uh, and uh, please stay tuned to the next ones. Uh, the, we're going to send uh, a message out to, uh, to you uh, about the next uh, sessions that are coming next year. Uh, I hope uh, uh, Leah is going to win uh, this uh, Saturday. <laughs> uh, and if you're going, please uh, be safe uh, and uh, carry masks with you uh, and follow the, the guidelines and all of that. And, and obviously, uh, you're uh, welcome to come to the libraries and uh, enjoy the resources that we're providing you. Uh, so all the best and have a good evening. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.